Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight, episode 84, the journey to getting the right gear. And we were literally just talking about this before we came online. That's why we ran a little bit of a two minutes late, which is actually pretty good for us, Ben. I have to admit, that's yeah, we're getting that, better. That, that's on time. <laughs> that's on time for us. That is shady bushcraft time right there. I mean, honestly, if you're that concerned about time, then maybe a watch. Is in order as I have a watch in my hand. Anyway, yeah. So the journey to getting the right gear. Watches are a whole other topic. We could talk about that. That actually might be a good topic one of these times. Oh, we're we're definitely having a watch topic. It's going to be my buy more watches. <laughs> oh, for sure. Ben is the resident watch expert between the two of us, and I mean he's got quite a bit of knowledge there. So if you have watch questions, Ben is the one to talk to. But uh, tonight, getting the right gear. There's kind of several processes that go into getting the right gear. And we thought we'd maybe talk about some of the ways people do it. And uh, hey, Christopher, how's it going? Thanks for joining us again. And maybe give some suggestions as to how we do it. Um, and even individually, we may have a little bit of differences there. But I think Ben and I are pretty much on the same ballpark when it's how we come to getting our gear. Um, and one of the methods we talked about right from the get-go... Uh, actually, no, no. Let me back up a little bit there. What about you, Ben? Let's let's get your input on this before I start rambling right down the rabbit hole here. Um, well, this this topic is I, I think, and this is just me predicting the future, but I think this 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 episode is going to run long um, because there's a lot of methods that I, I know both of us use, but it's it's all about figuring out what the right gear is, and you don't know when you start. And I think that's when we start it with what are we going to talk about tonight. And whether we, we, we've been talking about this for a few days, this this isn't all off the cuff. Some days it is, but this week it isn't. Uh, the thing is, is looking at it from, say you were a new person, somebody who, who's, who's new to this or coming back to this after a few years. How do you get the right gear? How do you get the gear? And it's 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 a huge journey. And I think the word you used there earlier was the journey to getting the right gear. It's It's a lot of methods. It's research. I spend a lot of time researching things. Uh, you know, hear about something new. Is that going to be for me? Is that something I'm going to enjoy? Is that my my style, my pattern? My, is that something I would enjoy? And then there's actually getting it. Um, so I think where you were going, and correct me if I'm wrong, is oftentimes both me and you, we, we, we choose the cheap option. Right? Oh, so, exactly. yeah. Um, whether that is to make it ourselves out of, out of readily available materials or cheaply available materials or to buy a cheap version on Amazon. Uh, an example of that might be the cheap $15, $20 hammock on Amazon. Uh, this is probably a pretty good example, right? Dead example for me. That was the one I actually had uh, loaded up because oh. my hammock is still or the one I still use, as you've seen, is my quote-unquote cheap one. I have a more expensive one that I hang out in my sunroom that actually doesn't come with me too much uh, because the cheaper one had more features that I liked. So this is all stuff that has to go in into your journey. Um, and I'll come back to that story because there were some points I wanted to make on that. But Okay, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, it's 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 been sort of that way with me too. And, and I mean, I've got expensive gear and I've got cheap gear. And... What a lot of people would probably find, I think, a little surprising is similar to your hammock story. Sometimes the cheap gear is is my go-to gear. Um, my Mora knife, which, well, honestly doesn't cost that much and, and cost me absolutely nothing because I, I got it for free on a Facebook thing, um, is been for the last two years pretty well my go-to knife. I have a Groman, like, trout and bird knife. Uh, it's a beautiful little knife. Uh, it, it was a uh, seconds, and it still cost me three times. I think what this more it would cost me. Um, and it's not my go-to knife. It's a beautiful knife. It works great. Does a good job. It's just not the one I grab. When I grab a knife, I want something that I, you know, that more it just does the job for me better. And that's that's kind of the the thing about it is just because you spent a lot of money doesn't mean you have a better piece of gear. Um, well, see, we're already kind of going down that hole. What, let's talk about that. The one method of getting this stuff and the one that Ben and I jump on more often than not is purchasing the cheaper gear. Like Ben said, 
Now, the benefits to doing that, as I think you would agree, Ben, is that if something goes wrong, even if you, uh, or sorry, if you like the piece of equipment and something happens to it, you're out no great amount of money. Would it yes. be safe to say the reason that your more is your go-to knife is because you don't mind beating on it and stuff like that? The benefit of that is it's a good enough product that it can take all that abuse and keep on ticking as well. Like, it's kind of that diamond in the rough. But the reality is, if you went out and for some reason you lost or broke that Mora knife, you're truly out not a whole lot of money. Maybe some sentimental value and you'd be bummed you lost a knife that you're always using, but you're not out any significant financial burden out of that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a huge part of it. The replacement cost, if I wanted to get something that's equivalent and the same, I know I can pick up for 20 to 30 bucks, which, you know, honestly, you know, might to some people be a little bit of a hit, but I can pretty well do that every week and not feel too guilty about it. Um, but a hundred dollar knife, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have to sort of put that aside and make the decision that that's, you know, I'm probably not going to get another thing for a couple of weeks because I have to kind of make up that. Um, and then if it was like a three or $400 knife, honestly, I probably wouldn't take it in the woods. I'd be terrified I'd lose it. <laughs> no, and I completely agree with you. And Christopher just had a, a comment here. We might as well address it. Is when you also agree that the most high-end products uh, have lifetime guarantees so that if you do break, rip, or tear, uh, you can get another one. And yes and no. This is not true with all products at high-end price points. Um, generally, they'll have somewhat of a, a better warranty. But that's still just, not all the time. I'm thinking a lot of knives and stuff like that. Uh, even the high-end ones potentially don't have lifetime warranties depending on how they're used. And I mean, it's going to be safe to say that if you take your knife out into the woods, you're probably not using it to the uh, exact way that they would tell you. Like, I'm, I'm thinking if you break your knife batoning or something like that, nobody's going to replace that. They don't, unless they, uh, generally they're not going to replace that unless you actually have a knife that specifically says in its contract or it's, it's uh, policies that, yes, you can use this for batoning. But if you break it batoning and you call up the company, regardless of how good their warranty is, chances are they're going to ask, well, how'd you break it? And you said, oh, it was hammered on back of it with a stick of wood. They're going to look at you and go, well, it was never designed to do that. So you're kind of up the creek. Uh, and that goes sleeping bags or another one like that. Uh, generally, it won't be if you rip or tear it. It's if it's manufactured defect is what a lot of these warranties will cover you under. If it arrives on site and there's damage or if during the first little while you're using it, the stitching comes undone and it doesn't look like it's been stressed and pulled apart. It just kind of failed. Then, yeah, stuff like that is generally covered as where cheap stuff would not be. I agree. But that doesn't always mean that, oh, you ripped your hammock or you ripped your hammock, you ripped your sleeping bag, you ripped your tent. Oh, yeah, well. We'll replace that for you. It's generally in the fine print that says it has to be a manufacturer's defect or fault. Not all the times, but generally broad brushing it here. Uh, yeah, T tents and sleeping bags are very similar. Uh, you get a, a burn hole in something like that, or you've ripped it because you put it on uh, on rough, sharp soil. You're, you're right. They're not, you know, very few companies, if any, is going to say, well, oh, you know, uh, sorry about that, you know. There is a limit, and a lot of times it is what where we use our gear, how we use our gear is maybe a little rougher than was intended. So but there is definitely that. You know, if you, you move outside of that, that comfort zone, the, your warranty may be out. Granted, though, too, like if it does fail uh, for no fault of your own, a more expensive product will generally be covered. Um a lot of that still depends on just your own wherewithal. When you get something, you know, do a decent uh, inspection of it, make sure it's in good shape and, and, and going to handle the type of things you, you're going to do with it. Um, you know, if you take some, a tent out and realize all the stitching is pretty shoddy, uh, probably shouldn't be taking it in the woods. You know what I mean? No, 100% agree with you. And I, I suppose to reiterate or add to the point is there are some products out there that do have true lifetime warranties against abuse and stuff like that. They're very few and far between. And if you do find one of them, sometimes it's worth paying the extra money. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. But you definitely have to read the fine print is what I stress about in that. Um, but yeah, generally that's why Ben and I kind of gravitate towards the more cheaper options. Not necessarily the more cheaper. 
I guess we go with the cheaper option if it's something we haven't tried before. Uh, like for me, I, I didn't know if I was going to enjoy hammock camping, and I kind of did the, the, the backwards of this. Uh, and this is the story I want to get back to. Amazon reviews, worthwhile or BS? I actually have a little input on that. I'm sure Ben does too. We'll, we'll loop back around to that, I'm sure, at some point in this topic. Uh, but yeah, hammock camping. So I went out and I went to one of the big box marts. I can't remember if it was Walmart or Canadian Tire, Costco, something like that. And I bought what I thought was, um, you know, not high-end luxury hammock, not low-end crap hammock. I bought somewhere around $120, $130 hammock. And I said, all right, this is what I'm going to use to try and, you know, start my hammock camping career in, if you so will. And honestly, I, I didn't care for the hammock at all. It was a little uncomfortable. Uh, I found the material stretched and distorted in a weird way. And granted, it was probably because it is a product from a, you know, one of those big box stores and not a true outdoorsy store. Uh, there's other things there too, which I'm sure we'll loop it back around to. But I based my purchase solely on the price of that product. I tried to pick, you know, not really middle of the ground, but maybe a tier up from middle of the ground. And it kind of backfired in my face. It, I, I ended up not enjoying the product. And then for giggles, uh, I found another one online. It was like $28 delivered to my door, a complete hammock system. A hammock with a net that came with straps, carabiners, like the whole kit caboodle. All you had to do was go out and string it to some trees. And I still use that hammock to today. It's the one that we actually did the how to set up a hammock video for uh, Atlantic bushcraft, like, and it, I mean, it was dirt cheap in the aspects of what's a, you know, a price for a hammock. Cause you, you'd know this a little bit better than I would Ben. Uh, what's a higher, well, okay. Let's not go with extreme end, uh, hammock, but what, what would be a high end price point, reasonable high end price point? I'm thinking uh, like, three, believe it or not, three to $500 will get you an, a pretty awesome hammock. Um, and oftentimes that'll include the the tarp system within with it. I think the one I have, we bought a handful of them at, at the same time, and it was a little over two hundred bucks for my mosquito hammock, which is, uh, it, you know, that's the website mosquitohammock.com. It's you know double layer uh, pocket on the inside, some zippers, nice net uh, net over the top with with tie points to stretch it out. But mine's also highly modified, as is yours. Yeah. Uh, I know highly, but it's modified. I mean, the very first thing we did with yours is throw whoopee slings on. But and, that, not always does that feature come in other hammocks either. That potentially could be an upgrade to almost any hammock. Yes. But, I mean, that is a huge upgrade. Um, a friend of mine, I, I helped him set one up a little while ago. and We took the stock one out, and it came with... Uh, tree hogger straps some carabiners and a, no real adjustability so he chose two trees we tied it up we went to hook it up and it was like either you know it just wasn't going to reach so trying to use the system they sent we tried some rope to see if we could make little extenders to get it to fit right and uh that snapped and it was only a few minutes and i said that's enough of that and i took some whoopee slings that i had on another hammock and threw on this one and Bob's your uncle. I mean, it's it may you know it's day and night the difference. Uh, and no, and I honestly, agree. If anybody's wondering too, uh, if you have a hammock system, go out and get some whoopee slings. Best yes. upgrade you'll ever do. <laughs> no doubt about that. After you've used them, right? Oh man, that that I don't know how or why I ever did without them. Um, yeah, uh, some people like the railroad track system, the, the with with the whole bunch of loops, and you just choose one loop or the next. Honestly, like. The infinite adjustability within like six to twelve feet on a on a whoopee sling, and if you build your own whoopee slings, you can make it greater or less, uh, and down to you know like a micro uh, amount, and the absolute no work is just like pull it to the length you want and walk away. It's done. Uh, it is great. I've tried the uh, OCR system. I was not as pleased with that. It's lighter. It's a little bit smaller. It slips. Even with the additional berry that I put into the system, uh, overall, I was relatively displeased with it. And I had it to the point where I tied a knot in it to prevent it from slipping. And then the thing went so tight that I couldn't even adjust it anymore. Uh, I just was not pleased with that system. But the uh, whoopee slings, 
a great system. But that's part of the learning process, right? Like the first one I had, I didn't have a whoopee sling. Um, part of the journey is trying different things and, re- and doing the research after you get it, saying, okay, I like the, the way this product works. How can I make it better? And you just keep improving. And I think in the end, that's the thing for so much of your gear. If you watch anyone who's really into the outdoors, and I'm, I mean, we're not just talking hammocks here, tarps, how you tie your tarps out, how you set them up, how you, how you store them. These are all uh, things that people modify. They leave, you know, like press it lines or, or adjust um, uh, different types of uh, guy line locks and stuff just to make it simpler and quicker. Uh, knives, how many guys? take a base knife and then add a sharpener to the to the sheath or a ferro rod wrap it with some paracord to make it a little bit more feasible but more useful um, or buy different sheaths than the ones that come with it to get what you want it's it's finding that one product you want and then making it that much better by making it yours no, 100% guarantee, uh, agree with you. And that's kind of the benefit of the way we go about things for finding our gear. Per- sometimes purchasing the cheaper stuff, even if it doesn't hold up the way you would hoped, gives you an idea of how uh, that product would act if you bought a better one. Uh, like for me, the hammock, the $30 hammock, I want to give it a shot going hammock camping again. I'm like, all right, I'll try a little different design. Um, yeah. cause this was a little different design. It was still parachute material, but I mean, it, it had the whole kit and I thought, okay, well maybe if I have straps and stuff like that, it'll make the experience better. Bug net was included in this one. And I mean, for 30 bucks, even if I fell through it after a night, I kind of got my money out of it. You know what I mean? I, I really wouldn't cry throwing it away. I'd be like, ah, you know, I spent $30 in the last week on coffee. As opposed to if I went and bought a 200 to a $500 hammock, I slept in it and hated it. Well, now I'm stuck with this thing, unless I resell it. But even then, I'd have to sell it as used. You know what I mean? So I'm going to take a significant hit on it just to try it. Um, But that leads into the next segment. That is another way of potentially finding your gear. Not as popular with myself and probably not yourself, Ben. But purchasing the high-end gear, trying it out. And if you don't like it, just reselling it to recoup some of your money. Now, in my experience, and maybe it's just because I have poor luck selling stuff... I never make enough money back to even justify attempting that. Like a lot of people will be like, oh, you'll just lose the amount you would on a cheaper product anyway. Like, no, I lost enough that I could have bought five of the cheaper product and still had money to go to dinner with. Like that's the kind of luck I have when I sell stuff. Well, when I look at something used, the the going thought in my process is you should be able to buy a used product for approximately half of what it was new. That's that's kind of my my standard that I set. So if you have a five hundred dollar sleeping bag or a five hundred dollar tent, if you've taken it out, used it, to me it's already two hundred and fifty dollars. That's the most I would ever personally pay for something. So when someone says, Oh, it's only used once or only used a little bit, well, sure it has, but you purchased it, you got to choose the color, you got to choose like what you got, and now you're done with it. And Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to buy it from you, but I expect that because now I'm kind of stuck with what you had, I'm expecting a little bit of, of, of uh, back from me. Now, that's not for everyone. I mean, that's if you're trying to sell to me. That's approximately what, you know, if you're asking much more than half, I'm going to be pretty leery to buy it. Um, and it's often a lot of things I just don't want to buy used because I, I don't know what's been done to it. I don't know if, you know, you know, you don't, you don't have that. You don't even have the really the ability to go back to say Amazon and say, man, I had this product for a couple of weeks and it's now not working the way I, I thought it would. Or you, you don't have those options where if you did buy the original and you come back to Amazon and say, man, I bought this six months ago, but you know, it's really not working properly. Good chance they'll, they'll turn around and say, well, here's some of your money back or send it back or, or an exchange whatever or something. You, but, you might uh, get, but as a, as a secondhand buyer, you got no no real protection, no guarantees to, to even a warranty or guarantee, right, with the, the original company. Well, even at that, uh, getting something used and it fails, was it fault of the product or fault of the previous owner? You don't have a backstory to that. There's only a handful of people I would trust actually buying something used on and taking it at face value if they told me. Like, 
I'm not saying other people are liars. I'm saying uh, perspective is what you make it. You know what I mean? Oh, I didn't abuse that. Well, what's abuse to you? You know what I mean? Yeah, what yeah. your idea of abuse is and what my idea of abuse is, is could be completely different. Like abuse to me might be putting, taking that tent and putting it out in a field that has a whole bunch of tree roots and rocks in it. And abuse to you might be like putting it on a shale pit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the, the, it, it's all relative. So you don't have a perspective on that. Uh, now, somebody in the comments there, I believe it was Chris. Chris, how do you gauge you got your money's worth on thir on a $30 product? Once again, that's the problem. It's relative. Did I spend $30 on a can opener or did I spend $30 on a tent? Uh, mm -hmm. If I spent $30 on a tent, it would have to keep me dry one night. And I basically got my $30 worth. may never work again, but a tent for 30 bucks. If I got anything beyond that, I got a great value. Now, if it was $30 on a can opener, I would assume that can opener is going to be the last can opener I ever buy, providing it's a manual can opener. Like, that's a lot of money for something I can buy at the dollar store that functions for a couple of years before it has to be replaced. So once again, relative, you know what I mean? Uh, I wouldn't set yeah. the $30 price point. I would set percentage for high-end product. So if I pay 10% of a high-end product fee, let's go for, in this case, uh, a $300 hammock, which is like, you know, roughly high end. Uh, and I spent the 30 bucks, which I did. Same kind of thing. If I got, you know, a couple nights out of it and I enjoyed it, I got my monies out of it. If I got one good comfortable night out of it, I probably would be okay with it and satisfied. I may not buy another one kind of deal. But anything above and beyond that, you know, it just keeps going up for my value for my money. Now, sleeping bag, prime example, like this uh, Teton one I have sitting over here or Titan, or however you say that. Anyway, it was a, a, a rather large purchase for me and what I generally spend money on. Uh, it was $160 plus tax and all that. It came in just a little under 200 bucks, I think. Uh, and it was a product that neither of us had any real experience with. You had used the... Um, Trailblazer. Yeah, the Trailblazer. Trail. And we were comparing it directly to... Uh, what's that down one you just picked up? Uh, one tigers which one tigers was a brand name that you yourself had a few products with and you could at least say you know the brand name is good their products are generally good and you have that to back it up so that's another thing when you're picking gear is what is the brand name uh and what is the reputation that way and i mean the reviews online were good and this kind of loops back to that amazon review question do you trust them or not i find if you pick the middle of the road reviews you generally get the most honest responses the five star responses are generally either just people that uh legitimately had good responses to it uh they may be paid advertisements or they may be just people that unboxed it, looked at it, and threw it back in, and it's great. You know what I mean? Like, there's a whole scale in there. Same as the number, like, the one-star reviews. It could be somebody that had a defective product, misused the product, uh, or didn't get the product they expected. So, a whole variance in there. But generally, around, like, the two to four stars, anywhere in there, people have generally thought about what they want to rep or how they want to rep represent this product in the review. Uh, and have gone through the trouble of actually, you know, taking a star off or adding a star on. They're generally your more truthful responses. I don't buy yeah. anything that only has five star reviews. I know, sounds crazy, right? But I at least want to hear something bad about a product that I'm going to, to get. If there's nothing bad about it, I expect it to be somewhat falsely represented. Uh, if that I makes any kind of sense. Especially with reviews, I look for a couple of things. I look for number of reviews. If it's got 10 reviews... That's not overly trustworthy. If it's got a thousand reviews, now I'm starting to think we got a good chance. And then same as you. Basically, the top 10% of the reviews, I ignore completely. The bottom 10%, I ignore pretty well completely. Because generally when I've read those, there are people who really don't know what they're talking about. Uh, on either side, uh, you have people like, oh, I bought this can opener and uh, it, it doesn't turn on a light the hell what did, did you think it was like i don't get it and then some of the best can opener ever owned well, why why was it the best can opener ever owned? Ever owned? Like, i don't get it is it the only can opener you owned yeah. exactly uh chris i did the same for the teton xl minus 26 funny enough i got one hanging on my wall after the teton um minus 18 that i bought myself we got the uh teton titan whatever xl uh minus 20 double sleeping bag 
for me, Family my wife and we went out, and that thing is amazing. Like it, it's gigantic, but it is amazing. Excuse the mess of the office here, but like, let's see if we can get this off here without causing too much trouble. You see it like hanging over there on the wall. Like the thing is massive, as you can see, but it is one of the best double sleeping bags I have literally ever purchased. That thing is absolutely amazing. However, it is gigantic. I would not take that thing like hiking or backpacking anywhere. It weighs like six to 10 pounds or something like that. The bag is two feet long. <laughs> it is not a trail friendly um, sleeping bag. No. But for a drive up kind of deal where we used it, probably hands down best sleeping bag I've ever crawled inside. It is amazingly comfortable. Tons of room for two people. Actually, me, Melissa, and Lily all got in it. Still had a little room to spare. I mean, you know, without thrashing about, which most of us don't do in a sleeping bag. But, uh, yeah, like, but I had, we had purchased that based off the original sleeping bag that I had picked up. You know what I mean? So, once again, we started going to brand reputation with that. I got the Teton bag. I went over it with a fine-tooth comb, looked at the stitching, and I mean, I was genuinely impressed with the quality of it, so I was willing to take that $200 risk on a second sleeping bag. Yeah, I mean, the, the Teton Trailblazer that I have is my go-to summer sleeping bag. Uh, and it's supposed to be rated to like minus four or something. Honestly, it's not. It's I've, I've been out in four degrees with it, and you're, you're freezing. <laughs> but... It is what it is, right? It's not a, it's not the ultimate sleeping bag, but it's a, it's it's a doable sleeping bag for summer and and even the shoulder season, uh, and it's what it's designed for. Um, yeah, so I think we should kind of get back on topic. I think yeah, we lost. I, I guess going with the sleeping bag one, I'm still kind of middle of the road for Teton products. I'm still not yep. to the point. Actually, you know what? Now that I've had these two sleeping bags and I've based a good review off it, I am eyeing up their, like, ridiculous minus 45 down sleeping bag. It's like 400 and some odd dollars. And if I was ever going to buy another sleeping bag, that's probably where I would be. You know what I mean? Because at that point, I'm going, like, that's the last sleeping bag I'll ever need to purchase. I'm so not the, go Oh, sorry. What's the pack size of that one? Uh, I'd have to look it up. Give me one second second and i will let you know because i do have it saved in my amazon but um going off that that's kind of the the risk you take when buying high-end stuff and using the top dollar you may not get your money back if you don't like that product uh or potentially you spent a whole ton of money for the sake of spending a whole ton of money and you could have gotten a cheaper product that would, you know, potentially do the exact same thing. Well, a good example of that. And, and here's a product that I own. I have, I've used, I kind of like it, but honestly, I don't use it very often. I bought the, uh, mech sill nylon guide tarp. Uh, honestly, there's nothing wrong with that tarp. It's a great little tarp. The, uh, the tie points are, aren't symmetrically laid out, which is, is a little bit of an annoyance to it. When I contacted Mac and complained about it, they said that's intentional. It gives you more setup options, but then they never did tell me what those set options were. And I had to go out and play with it. And I discovered a few that work and a few that don't and, and all that. And it's a great bit of fun. But then I went out and I bought uh, a one Tigris uh, one that's similar size, similar weight, um has more tie points more options really and uh, they're 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 equally laid out and i like it a lot better so if i had to choose between those two tarps i'm taking the one tigress one the one tigress one was on sale when i bought it i paid less well less than half what i paid for my mac one um so there's an example of spending a lot of money on a product that i could easily find a product for less that i was more happy with more content with um it's easy to fall into that trap that oh if i buy the best thing out there i'm going to have exactly you know i'm going to have the best thing it's not necessarily the best it's just you've paid a bit more money for something that that has a name or has a reputation um 
And I guess to a certain extent, what's that reputa reputation worth to you as well? You know what I mean? Maybe that is your thing. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I could probably sell that Mac tarp. I probably could if I tried. I could put it up there, say you use four or five times, zero rips, no burn holes, no nothing. And, you know, it's great shape. And, you know, maybe somebody would offer me 50, 60 bucks for this tarp that I paid 120 plus tax on it. But if I'm only going to get that, I'm not you know i'll keep it as a backup i take I, you know it often gets thrown in the pack because it is relatively lightweight and small um of course i can't find that sleeping bag that i was talking about <laughs> it's no longer not. listed hmm. uh so the one for minus 10 fahrenheit which is not the one i was looking at it was something like minus 23 fahrenheit but anyway uh, this one is 4.2 pounds, uh, 80, doesn't actually, oh, here we go, uh, 16 by 10, that's what its pack, uh, size is, at 4.2 pounds. So I assume the other one would be relatively smaller, I think, because this one is still the synthetic material, and I think the down pack down a little smaller. Actually, you know what, you and I put that together and there wasn't a whole lot of difference between the synthetic bag I had and the down one you had when it came to pack size. No. Uh, yeah, we, we did compare the one Tigris, I think it's Nordic defender. That's uh, it, yeah. To, yeah. To, uh, your, um, your tent and, uh, what was it? Not left. Uh, Altos. Altos. Uh, is it Altos? I yeah. Did. The one I had was the Altos. Yeah. Um, and, they were, you know, very comparable, really. Um, mine was probably marginally lighter, a little bit more squishy packed down, but not enough to really talk about. Like, not a much, you know, it didn't make much of a difference, I don't think. Um, so it's really, you know, what you want. I mean, I we paid about the same for it. We found that they packed about the same. They weighed about the same. Uh, just looking at them without like a scale and going down to grams and going down to millimeters. Uh, it's ballpark the same thing. Uh, advantages and disadvantages to both. I mean, with my down sleeping bag, uh, when it first came, I, I opened it up and it, there was virtually no loft. I took it down and threw it in the dryer with a bunch of tennis balls before I got the loft. Mm -hmm. It actually took some work and effort when I store it. I got to be really careful to not store it compressed otherwise it takes that much longer for it to come back so i have like a big laundry bag and it hangs from the ceiling so it's always as fluffy as it can be um but when it works and everything's good it's great you know i, I do enjoy it and it's right about the time of year now where that's that sleeping bag's coming back out I'm kind of excited yeah, my I last trip eyeball in mine too and i'm like yeah it's probably about time i get that sucker dug back out well actually it's hanging on the wall up there too but it's time to you know, get out in the woods with that one. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but yeah, the journey to finding the right gear for yourself is is not dead simple. It's not, you know, it's not straightforward. It's, there's no set path, but it, it really is a, a large thing of researching the things you're interested in, thinking about the types of trips you're going to do. Um, is that gear really you know, because you may see a piece of gear you fall in love with, but when you sit down and think about it, it's just not functionally the right gear for the type of stuff that you really want to do. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that you could find, say, really nice woodsman's axe that you really like because it, it looks cool, it, it, it fits your hands well, it's really good. And you think about it, well, all the trips I want to do, I want to do in, say, um, national parks where you're not really allowed to cut trees down you're not really allowed to do this that and the other thing is question is do i need a woodsman's axe for the type of trips i do and the, the answer might be no all i really need is a is a knife maybe i don't need the buck saw maybe i don't need the knife we you know a lot of trips in the last few trips i took in parks we have an axe and a buck saw and honestly the amount of times either of those tools get used very minimal so, but it's good gear. It's gear I love to use. It's love to play with. Unfortunately, in a lot of places, just not needed. You know, not a required piece of gear. 
and probably not the best thing to spend a lot of money on a piece of gear that you're just not going to need just because it looks cool or feels cool it may not be the the best choice um with that i think that makes sense yeah and and you kind of mentioned it that's the other thing sometimes you're just throwing money for the brand name for no other reason then it just has that brand name stamped on it and you're going to pay top dollar for that brand name yeah i get I, this is one that we I've talked to a lot of people about because I look at the Grand Force Brooks uh, axes, and they look awesome. I've 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 held a couple. They're very good axe. The question I ask people is: Is it really that much better than say a Husqvarna axe, or you know an East Wing axe or S Wing, whatever you want to call it, S-wing. or many other yeah. ax- axes that I can buy for less than a half, and. You know, I mean, take the the Husky uh, Husqvarna axe. I mean, they look very similar. I think they're both made in a similar area of the world. Uh, I think they both come from uh, Sweden. Uh, I'm, don't don't miss my guess on that one. You know, they're they're comparable axes. One costs a lot more than the other. You know, one's maybe a little more handmade. One's you know, a little bit more time and effort put in making it just just so. But in the end, uh, the axe I carry, you've seen a couple of the axes I carry, uh, is one is a condor, and it's been modified. Not not only by me, a few people have owned this axe. It's a used axe. So I bought an axe, or I, I traded for an axe used. And after I got it, I talked to a bunch of people, and they're like, yeah, I own that axe before the last guy maybe before the guy for him and i did this and, and this guy did that and he did this to the handle and it's like oh so this is nowhere near a stock axe and you're like no no it's you know but it, it works good it's nice you know i enjoy it uh, i sent you the link to that uh that sleeping bag i was talking about it's still 4.2 pounds but uh yeah. any case yeah it, it's there's a lot to it i mean Another good way of getting some gear, or at least finding out where you want to sink your money into, is literally just doing the research. Uh, you know, I think you'll agree with me, Ben. It's way easier to make an informed decision on gear now than it was, say, 15 years ago. Oh, yeah. The internet has yeah, I... shrunk the world. Like, before, you would have to get a magazine or go into the store, look at the product you want, Maybe get your reviews off whoever that editor happened to be in that magazine to write the article you were looking this thing up in. And that's it. That's what you had to go on. And you had to decide if you want to spend the 80 bucks or the 300 to 400 bucks based off solely that. Today's day and age, YouTube is your friend. Uh, jump right. on YouTube and get people to set these things up. It gives you not only their review on it. Uh, a lot of times I actually look past the review and look at the product, how it's functioning while they're doing their own review on it. If that makes any kind of sense. And the neat thing, like most YouTubers will respond to you. So if if I just throw you know throw throw a dog a bone type thing, if Jeremy is is reviewing uh, a tent, you can reach out to Jeremy and say like, listen, I see you reviewed this tent. You know, what are your thoughts on this, or what about this, or if you were comparing these two, what you know, what would you be looking at as the differences? It's, it gives you an opportunity to talk to somebody, you know, a real human being, not, not just a salesperson for that company, and get some, you know, some hands-on info and in, in, in that back and forth, which didn't really exist a few years ago um, to the same level. The other one, like the old-fashioned one, is just if you know anyone who's into it, check it what they got. Back in one uh, sec there, Ben, just cover for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I have extra gear that I oftentimes, you know, a friend will come over and I'll say, like, try this out or try see what this is like. Or, you know, having that ability to sort of test something before you purchase it or or make that leap. You know, you may find that certain piece of gear is not what you want. Um, Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, you're back. I am. I was just saying. Basically, you could, you know, potentially borrow gear or, or find somebody who has gear. I know with, you know, I was going to say with hammocks. There's quite a few people with hammocks that more than happily let you borrow their hammock for a night or 
test it out, right? Oh, yeah, um, for sure. I mean, uh, Underquilt, prime example. I borrowed one from you on the very first adventure we went out on. Oh, yeah. I didn't know if I wanted to spend money on an Underquilt. I didn't know if I'd like an Underquilt. By using the one I borrowed from you, I now know what I want to find in an Underquilt. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've seen yeah. it. And that, that's a good way to do things. Borrow some gear. Most people that have some gear and are really oriented towards the woods, uh, like you said, they won't hesitate to let you try something. Generally. Yeah. I mean, there, there's some personal stuff. If you want to wear my like long johns, I might draw the line there. Uh, maybe not. Depends who you are and if you bought me dinner first. But <laughs> <laughs> There is a way to get in your pants. <laughs> it's always through the food. <laughs> Um, yeah, for me, it, it would be my knives. It's a little harder for me to loan those out. <laughs> Certain sense. ones for me. I got ones that are my knives. And then I have ones that are like, you want to try it? Be my guest. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everyone has their beater knife that anyone can take. And, you know, and then there's, you know, the one that you've put an edge on and you, 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 you just have a comfortable and you're like, yeah, you're not ruining this for me. You're not no. taking this. Out. Um, but yeah. There are so many ways, I and mean, we talked a little bit, you know, buy the cheap things, see, see if it, you know, it functions and works the way you want before you jump into it. Do the research on YouTube or other media. <clears throat> There's buying the expensive item, testing it because you, you think, okay, there's no way I'm going to like the cheap item. Let's buy the expensive item. If I don't like it, I can resell it and hopefully get most of my money back. Uh, that that's a method. I, I think it's, it has a, a layer of risk where for me and you, when we buy the cheap object, we're probably not going to resell it if we don't like it, but it's always a backup if it does, didn't fail outright. Um, so I have two or three cheap hammocks that I just keep around. Oftentimes I loan them out to people or I let my daughters use them or, or I just have them there. Um, and it, to me, it's often just a backup because if my primary system breaks for whatever reason, probably my stupid fault, then I can, you know, I still have a way. Like if yourself called me next week and said, Ben, I'm doing this great trip. You want to come? I'm like, man, I ruined my hammock last week. I got to wait for you three months for a new one to come in. No, no, I can just grab my cheap one and I'll go as if nothing had ever happened. And then I'll make the decision if I'm going to replace say that my mosquito hammock, which I have been pretty happy with, to maybe a Hennessy, which I want to test out, or a Blackbird, or a Dream Hammock, um, and so many other brands. There's a lot of good brand names out there you can look for, and they have a ton of options and stuff, and sometimes what you want is just the simplest hammock because it's lightweight. For sure, and I mean, uh, a good way to find a lot of this information, once again with research, web forms. I, I kind of forgot to mention that. Maybe you did while I walked out, but web forms is a super great way to get information because now you have real people generally posting real things and those that aren't real people, like their reps and stuff like that, you, you can usually pick them out pretty quick. You know what I mean? Like they, they do kind of stand out like a, a light in the darkness, if, if you well, know what I mean. If somebody only talks about one single brand, then you pretty well know that they're either completely brainwashed or work for the company. Um, you know, me and Robert, we may talk about a few brands that we use quite a bit. We are by no means married to any of these brands. I will so quickly jump to a different company or a different thing. If I find something that I, that intrigues me more, um, you know, we are, you know, we're, we're not saying that we wouldn't be sponsored if the right person offered us the right amount. We're, we're, but you know. I, even at that, I would refuse to not be an honest sponsor in all honesty. Oh, yeah. I, if their product was junk, I'd probably yeah. call it. I, I might find a nice way of saying it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like the proverbial open handed slap more than the closed fisted yeah. jaw punch. But I, I mean, I'd be more inclined to be honest than not. Oh yeah. Which, I mean, there's no point in telling someone this is the best product in the world. If it's not, you're yeah. not going to, but uh we do have a couple of questions from the comments so why don't we pick that up uh mr anglers welcome to the party uh late maybe but never too late i don't think there's ever too late in our channel 
there's always something going on. Um, so I, I had seen the question. Where did it go? Uh, there was somebody, uh, and I can't remember who it was, and it's here, and I tried to keep an eye on it. Uh, it's so good. I wrote the bottom one down here. Nice story. Okay. Thoughts on popular YouTube camping guys? Follow their gear or are they just using the stuff uh, they get from sponsors for free? So, once again, they kind of stick out like a, a candle in the dark if they're really feeding it to you. If they absolutely list nothing but good things and no downsides generally, uh, yeah. They're, and I mean generally. I'm not saying this about everybody. Uh, nobody out there take offense to this. But generally... They are sponsor fishing or trying to appease their sponsors. And you honestly can't blame them for that to a certain level. Like a lot of these companies that sponsor people, they're sending them high end or their high end product, or there's money involved on some level. You know what I mean? So at that point you are kind of getting paid uh, to do stuff like that. And that's why one of the reasons I've never really tried to go hardcore looking for sponsorship. And Ben and I have talked about this before because we don't really want to marry to any one company. Now, that being said, if somebody was to stumble along and offer us something to try out, we've always said, we'll give you a 100% honest review. But right. if a company was to approach us and be like, okay, uh, we're going to sponsor you for sleeping bags, but you can only ever buy our sleeping bags, uh, you know, and you always have to say good stuff about them, I, I'd have a really hard time taking that sponsorship. And I'm sure yourself would too, Ben. I mean, unless their bags were absolutely amazing. But even at that point, I think a good company speaks for itself. If they're telling you only plug our product uh, and never say anything bad about it, then they technically might have something that they don't want getting out there. You know what I mean? Like it, maybe it's something minor, but a good company should be like the product speaks for itself in my mind. And that's the kind of product I would want to recommend to people. And when people don't do that, they do stick out like that candle in the dark. You, you can tell they're usually feeding you on for something. You definitely have a mixed bag out there. there. There are people who are very loyal to one company or one, one group of products, and um, they are that way because they are sponsored. You have ones that are 100% honest, and you have everything in between. Um, and that's why it really helps to hit two or three places and see what the people are saying. Uh, and try to get a real feel for, for people that you do trust. Like Just because you see one review by someone doesn't mean you really know much about that person. But if you watch four or five of the reviews, you get a good feel for how they're doing things, right? No, for sure. And and Chris actually made the point of, based off Jeremy's channel, Lone Wolf 902 who we, we talk about frequently on our own channel because he, you know, he's kind of a friend of ours, uh, sold him on the One Tigers products. Newer company, solid reviews. But if you look at Jeremy's reviews on One Tigers, yeah, a lot of them are good, but he will still pick out negative things about any product they send him. Like if it's truly something he doesn't like, uh, he has no shame or no hesitation to point that out. Uh, and sometimes it's, just, I'm, I'm thinking about like the, the Anchorage review he did and some of those other ones, like he pointed out all the faults that he thought were faults. And yeah. he says, and you have to realize it's his opinion. What I find is a fault. Somebody else might find as a plus and vice versa. Yeah. So, and I, I, I happen to know that, He's had some products he he refused to review because he didn't think they were they were good enough or really brought anything to the table. So some things he just doesn't like. He gets it. He looks at it. He's like, not for me. Uh, and and I also know he's had the other thing too. He's had products that he didn't think he would review, and then after having used them for a bit, he was surprised. So he's he is very open and honest. Uh, for the most part, I mean, he's, he's in this for his own, you know, his own channel, his own thing. So, like, with anyone, and we're not going to say anything bad about anyone or anything great about anyone here. We're just saying with anyone, you know, take everything with a certain grain of salt and look for a few spots just to make sure that what you're getting is what you want. And I think that's the big thing. It's not just because we say or jeremy says or anyone else that we d deal with says this is a great product it may be it may not be the product for you 
And I think that's the real important thing. Uh, and yeah, regardless of what method you use to find your gear, make sure it's yeah. something you're interested in. Just don't buy it for the sake of buying it. If somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you have to have a buck saw. Absolutely have to have one. And up until that point, you've never really used one and you can't think of a good reason in the back of your head why you should have one. Don't waste your money on it. I mean, I like a buck saw, but I'm not going to say, oh, you need a buck saw. It's, this is why I like a buck saw. It's something you can see yourself interested in. And that's the kind of stuff you have to look for when you are doing your research. If somebody is trying to feed you a product, they're literally trying to feed you that product. You know, most people that are going to be genuine are going to offer you like, this is the good, this is the bad, this is why I think it's worth it. Yeah. Make your own decision kind of dealio. Um, take, for example, tarps. I think tarps are a great one. I mean, you can go to Canadian Tire and buy $5.00 six by eight tarp or 10 by 10 plastic poly tarp for five to 15 bucks. No problem. All day long. You can go, you can go to any dollar store and buy tarps. I have, you know, uh, if I can find the photo, I will show you my first hammock set up. Uh, and it is a dollar store tarp. Anyway, continue on your point. So my first hammock was actually a dollar. Uh, was a, uh, a poly tarp. <laughs> oh, I took that down. But you know, that's that's an example of a really cheap product you can go out and buy. You know, what are the advantages of it? Pretty well waterproof, pretty well bulletproof, honestly. Dirt cheap. What's the disadvantage? Really noisy. Mm. Uh, Doesn't pack well. Never, what? Never packs back down to the size it came from the store. Never, not, nothing even close. Uh, and the reality is, it still weighs a fair bit for what it is. Not tons, but still compared to, like I say, still nylon, it's a little bit heavier, a little bit bulkier. Um, you go to say your 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 uh, run of the mill midline tarp, so your your uh, poly or uh, polyurethane coated ones. You know, pack down a little bit better, a little bit lighter, a lot more versatility. Tie, tie down points are, are a bit different. They're not just grommet holes and stuff. But you're paying, what, 30 to 60 bucks for these? You, know, you can buy five to 10 cheap tarps for that. Is it, In the end, all these tarps have one major disadvantage. There's no floor. There's no bug net. Uh, you go camping in this fall like right now. I don't know if anyone else knows. The rodents running around lately are unreal. If you're not comfortable with that, tent might be even the option for you. Some a lot of people say tarp's the only way to go. Well, you can buy the poly tarp, you can buy the, the midline tarp, you can buy the, the hundred and something dollar tarp. In the end, they're all just the tarp. If tarp pamping isn't for you, if somebody pushed that onto you, you you took that on and then realized I don't like tarp camping. I don't like being that open. I don't like having not a, a set setup that I have to use. Um, then you fall in for something that's, you know, somebody else's ideal. A lot of people love tarp camping. Me and me and Robert both do tarp camping in a great thing. We do enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll tell you first off, it's not for everyone. It's not even for me some days. It, and it fits a need like um, different topic, different topic. Uh, so getting back on track. <laughs> no, well, it is a little off topic. I'm just trying to say like the journey to your, the gear for you. Yeah. Is finding out what works for you. Not just going to say, and I, I watched this one YouTuber, I watched this one person and then them saying, this is what everyone should have. That's their opinion what they like or for the style of camping they they like you have to find what works for you and it, it it may it's different for everybody otherwise we'd all have the exact same camping setup hmm. right um i'm just kind of flipping through our comments there they somehow got on to talking about uh handguns and i was just curious how that all started up uh, it, they're having their own conversation but uh um, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not what's for one person is a blanket for everybody. I mean, 
And that's really what you got to try and figure out when you start your journey for your own gear. And that's why the borrowing and trying other stuff is great starting off. It, it accumulates that knowledge and it's even better in its own than going out and doing the YouTube stuff because you've never had those products in your hand. Even if you try some stuff and you don't like it, you can pick out what you don't like about it and see that in other products. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I liked, honestly, about some of the cheapest products I bought. Like some of the, you know, the very entry level products you get out there and you start using them a few times. You're saying, I really wish I had this, whether it's say midpoint pullouts or uh, with an, a nice sheaf, a more positive lock. Or like once you see where something fails, and that's usually with the cheap stuff, you see what the, the weak points of the system are you can really make the decision we're saying well it didn't have this but it never was a problem for me but it did have you know i would have really liked this ability or this option or this capability um so then you start looking for those things you know you have an idea that this worked but it would be better if it could do this too right um no 100 percent. and i mean that will go on for a lot of your gear like uh you and I joke about it a lot. The ultralight camping, ultralight yeah. camping for me is 50 pounds. You know what I mean? Like that, that's a heavy end for most people, but realistically for me, you know, 40, 50 pounds, that's ultralight for me. I like my stuff. That's my whole style of camping is based around what I like that way. And that knows for me, like if I'm going to go walk the Appalachian trail or something like that, probably not going to do so well because you got to take so little gear. I could probably do it. Am I going to enjoy it? at that level maybe not and that's something i learned by trying some of the backpacking gear and the ultralight gear yeah there are some great benefits to some of this ultralight gear packs down small but sometimes there's sacrifice to that too the reason it packs down small is because it is small you know what i mean right. i'm not a small guy <laughs> so sometimes yeah. you figure that out as you go like um back to the hammocks my hammock is like six inches shorter than yours but you're taller than me, significantly taller, and that wasn't a problem to me. That is going to be a problem to somebody like you or Mark Young or somebody like that that's like plus 6'2". And it, it's going to be a bad time for me. I'm 5'10". I have no problem in that little hammock. You know what I mean? No. I'm actually very comfortable in it. And yeah. I, you probably would be up to like 5'11", maybe even 6'. It would be fine. But over that threshold, that's something worth noting, and it's something I have noted uh, when I did the review of that hammock, and if anybody's wondering, you can find that review on our channel. I took it over from uh, my old channel. I, I had something there before. Ben and I did this, so we kind of collaborated everything back into this one effort instead of trying to split things up. But yeah, that, that review's there, and you can see the hammock I'm talking about, and I think the picture that I'm talking about is in that video as well of me having the hammock set up with literally a dollar store tarp. Uh, and it, it worked fine. Uh, I learned that dollar store top tarps don't breathe well uh any humidity that gets under that tarp is going to stay trapped in with you so that's something you learn by trying cheaper gear so i always look for a tarp that has some level of breathe breathability and i learned you know maybe steep angles yes they keep heat in but they also keep moisture in so uh all things that you learn as you go and it's the good thing about borrowing gear like we said if you can borrow, and you don't even necessarily have to borrow it Get some basic gear, go out with somebody that has some of the gear you're interested in, and just look at their setups. The Nova Scotia Bushcraft Gathering, which we mentioned every now and then, is a great time to go out and look at a plethora of different equipment that you most likely haven't seen and don't have. Is that safe to say, Ben? Like, bushcraft gatherings like that, you can see tons of stuff. Oh, yeah, 100% sure. Um, in fact, every time I go there, I do see something new. So where is it? Some weird noise coming from my air conditioning unit. It wasn't on, so I'm kind of wondering if something crawled into it. <laughs> Is it telling uh, you to do stuff, Ben? Because that could be a whole other problem. No, no, that's the stove. Give stove. your nerves away. <laughs> no. <laughs> Robert, steal Jeremy stoves. <laughs> yeah, it's been coming out for years. <laughs> 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 like i said we poke fun at jeremy a little bit and i sure hope he does to us from time to time i haven't seen it yet i think he takes the higher ground on that but yeah i hope somewhere there's a blooper reel where he's just ragging us out because that would be awesome 
I'm sure uh, there is. What is this event? Can you put details in the comments afterwards? So, the Nova Scotia Bushcraft Gathering this year has not happened. Uh, due to COVID, it was not held this year. Generally, it's in August. And it's generally around the second weekend in August. Am I right there, Ben? Something like that. Somewhere, Somewhere between the second, third week in August. It's a weekend. It's usually four to five days. Anytime it's coming up we generally start spewing details on the channel because it is a great time to get out and meet. Uh, usually we go, Jeremy goes, a bunch of other bushcrafter YouTubers go. Uh, it's a good time to meet a whole bunch of people and see a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, the first year we went out, we had people like Wayne Colcraven come out. We had Mitch Mitchell, both of which were contestants on Alone. Uh, yep. I mean, you get to meet some real interesting people out at these events and not just Nova Scotia Bushcraft Gathering. Look for any kind of bushcraft gathering in your area and you're sure to meet some really neat people even if you've never heard of them before there's always neat people at these gatherings uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to meet people see new products um and see some local um products too like that was the other neat thing that we've seen there is is, is some local uh, products and skills and I'll just say it out loud for you there, Chris. Uh, his comment, not to plug for his favorite form, but plugging for his favorite form, and I'll give him the courtesy here. Uh, Bushcraft USA forums are great for bushcrafting meetups, and not just Bushcraft USA. Literally go on Google uh, or your search engine of choice if you're, you know, not using Google for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> I mean, who does not use Google nowadays? It, it's become a verb. You Google something. but Is, is, there, use, is there an option? I mean, I, I, there's I'm, Bing, there's Yahoo, I'm sure Metacrawl or Metaspider are probably still floating around. Ask Jeeves, I don't even know if that exists anymore. But if you are using something like that, just, you know, I want to say Google, but search the term bushcraft and your area, and I'm sure you'll find something relatively close to you. It might be a few hours away, but it's never going to be, like, an outrageous length away, or it shouldn't be, you know what I mean? There's always, like, a handful of people that want to get out and play in the woods. As yeah. long as there's trees around. You're in the middle of New York. Might be a little trickier. I'm not sure. Well, I'm sure there is, actually. Oh, I'm um, sure there is, too, honestly. But, yeah. Um, just a, an interesting fact. A few years ago, the most searched thing on Bing was Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, sure, Google it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Steve. Not pushing certain brands, but Google it. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of weird how uh, one search engine has kind of literally coined being the search engines. I know there's other ones out there. I know Yahoo still exists and stuff like that. Ask Jeeves. They're, they're, they are out there. Uh, I heard about it in 10 years. Yeah, Ask Jeeves was really reaching out there. But Ask Jeeves at one time was, you know, one of the running champions of search engines. I mean, there, there was stuff out there. There was times before google and i'm sure there'll be times after google but whatever right. it happens to be whenever you're watching this video past present or future time travelers out there it's all good uh, <laughs> do your search whatever search engine you want and and yeah youtube or any video service you can get on there search bushcraft in your area and you'll probably find some stuff i found interesting videos uh, just on nova scotia bushcrafters like not the actual nova scotia bushcrafting form but just nova scotia bushcrafters in general like they're just some variant of like ns bushcraft or bushcrafting nova scotia or you know yeah. nova scotia camping in the woods or something like that you'll find interesting people that aren't very far from you and they do stuff that you just find neat like i i seen several things there uh pieces of equipment that i had never thought about taking over pieces of equipment uh ben mentions one of his friends uses a giant steel bowl to make a fire in that's something I've never tried, but that is something that, you know, once you see it, you hear about it, you kind of look at it, and it's like, okay, well, why do you do that? And I've talked to Ben at length about this. Why would you ever take a giant bowl in? And we discussed the pros and cons of it, and now I'm kind of like, oh, okay, I can see why you do that. Uh, is it necessarily for me, given the situation? Maybe. And now at least I have the knowledge to base that on, and that's what doing some of this is. Uh, I mean, you are getting kind of a skewed version of stuff from Ben and I because you're only getting two people's opinions. Definitely get out there and broaden that a little bit. But yeah, with the fire bowl, just for example, if you're camping, leave no choice, uh, leave, no tra leave no trace, it allows you to have a fire, a nice concentrated fire. 
And when you walk away, there's no evidence you were there, really. Like, you can pretty well dispose and hide any evidence. So there's a time and place for it, for sure, right? Uh, if you're going into a park where there's a set fire, fire pit, then I probably wouldn't bother, uh, just for example. Um, yeah, I think the journey, though, overall, the journey to finding the right gear is getting out there, trying stuff, um, experimenting, playing. And in the end, every time you, you get a new piece of gear, every time you, you do a new trip, you're going to sort of come back from it. And, and me and my wife, we like to do this. After a trip, we'll sit there and say, well, what gear did we use? And when we use that gear, what did we get out of it? And was it worth it? Was it worth the weight? Was it worth the time? Was it worth the effort? And some gear doesn't make the cut. And other gear, uh, regardless of the amount we use it, still always makes the cut because it's a peace of mind or safety. Uh, a good example of this for, I think, everyone is your first aid kit. Hopefully, every trip you go, it never comes out. But just in case you do need it, it's a it's a piece of kit that's worth the weight. It's weight. Um, but if you carry, say, a camp chair every week, and, and we can carry our camp chairs, and you sit there and say, "I never really used it. Or I didn't enjoy it." So don't don't carry it. It's not for you. That wasn't you know. Um, and you, yeah, you knives are another great one with that. Uh, I got a Schrade knife at one of the Nova Scotia bushcraft gatherings. Uh, price point on it was significantly more than I had paid for any knife up to that point. Tried yeah. it a few times. Some things I liked about it, some things I didn't like about it. Now it's one of my knives I have in my collection, but it's not my go-to knife. And it's great no. to take a couple things out like that. As you said, see how much you actually use them. What do you like about something? What don't you like about something? If you are into flipping gear a lot, yeah, we've talked about it before, making bushcraft journals. Jot down what you had, what you liked, what you didn't like, and as you're looking for new and for new equipment, you can kind of go back to your own information and be like, well, what did I like about that? Uh, once upon a time, I was trying to get a custom knife made, and um, one of the questions was, well, what are you looking for in a knife? And I mean, at the time, I was like, I don't know, something sharp? Like, <laughs> I really had to think about it, and that's where it came in. Okay, well, I, I like a little longer handle. I, I like a, a, not as a pronounced finger groove. I don't like jibbing. Uh, I like yeah. a drop point. Like These are all things I learned as I went by trying these different types of uh, pieces of equipment, knives, and things like that. And that's the kind of stuff you have to do about every piece of equipment that you want to go out there. Yeah, it sounds long. Yeah, it sounds tedious. But honestly, that is that is the journey, is figuring it out as you go. And that's half the fun, honestly. It, it, sometimes it's just as fun to take a piece of equipment that is absolute junk out with you. Because you'll have a couple great laughs about it. You know what I mean? And my number one for that is the bags that come with the Sawyer Mini. <laughs> Sawyer Mini, I hope you don't crucify me for this, but the bags that come with that little Sawyer Mini, just throw them away. Just sell the Mini. That th Those are just atrocious. Yeah, and I can see people that have literally bought a Sawyer Mini, used it the way Sawyer intended, and said, this is garbage. Uh, but, I mean, I use it slightly different. I have the, the hydration bag. I hook it on. I hang it up. I, you know, I use gravity feet because I'm, I'm lazy and I don't like pushing things. Uh, and I find it great. I, I love the fact that I can back flush it. I love the fact that it can do so many values gallons of water i think it's like a hundred thousand gallons or something ridiculous uh i love all, a lot of stuff about it um but yeah those little bags those little tiny holes trying to fill them in a in a lake or river is all but impossible isn't it yeah no well you've seen we actually had great fun of me uh i don't even want to say it on our channel because it'll push us past our pg rating but uh i had fun trying to fill that in the river yeah but, uh, so question here, speaking of knives, I've been having a hard time with legal info, what's allowed, just get info on pocket knives and not other ones. Not sure what info you're looking at, but just a brief summary is anything over eight inches has to be carried exposed. Uh, if the blade length is over eight inches and it is technically hidden under your person's clothing or something like that, it's considered a concealed weapon in Nova Scotia. Uh, you can't have any knives that are one hand action. Uh, I know this opens up a giant gray area debate. Uh, a lot of those, you know, single flip opens, they claim those are one 
motion one flip open. Uh, I'm not getting into the semantics of that because that's a whole other thing. Good luck on that rabbit hole. But uh, they're talking more like uh, switchblades, belly clavas, not belly clavas. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, butterfly knives. Butterfly uh, knives, whatever the belly songs. Uh, uh, belt knives, because the blade is over eight inches long and it's hidden. Um, so technically legal, you could walk down the street with a sword, but that doesn't mean you wouldn't be hit for mischief or disturbing the peace. You know what I mean? Don't walk into a subway carrying a machete kind of deal. Yes, it's legal, but they may get you with something else. Yeah. But the bare bones of it is over eight inches has to be exposed. So some hunting knives, buoy knives, things like that. That's why you carry them on your belt where they show. It can be seen. If it's over eight inches blade length and it's hidden, technically that's a concealed weapon. Or at least it's always has been. Uh, I don't know if they've changed that in the last year or two. Yeah, I don't know yet. Um, switch to life straw. Actually, Chris, uh, Ben and his wife just picked up a couple of those life straws. Same kind of dealio. Um, if you use it the way it's intended, probably still great. I believe if you look at life straw, and 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 the wife got one or ordered one. She likes likes it for the concept. Life straw doesn't have the volume that a saw your mini is capable of, and I don't think it has the same filtration uh capability so it, it doesn't filter down to the same small level um that being said for where we are and for what we do it's functionally equivalent um just one is by the numbers a little bit more capable than the other um life straw i don't think you can back flush to the same level i'm not so sure i don't have a lot of experience with the life straw personally a buddy of mine and has I, one, but I've never actually taken it out and tried it. A life straw is one of those personal things. Um, you know what I mean? I, I just don't think I'd borrow somebody's life straw. No. Um, but, yeah, both good products. Both both have a decent following. Uh, Sire Mini is, is my personal choice for, like, camp. But the, the life straw, the one the wife has, is actually built inside of a, a bottle. Sort of like it sits on the in, in the inside and the reason she likes it is she's going to be able to yeah similar to that concept so what she's going to be able to do is while we're kayaking or canoeing she's just going to be able to fill her bottle screw the top on and, and treat it treat it like a, a bottle where with the sire mini in the without using the squeeze option it's going to be harder to fill up our bottles uh on the go so it's just six and one half a dozen in the other and those options uh, and some combination thereof is what we're going to be using she wants to have her bottle and her saw your mini her saw your minis for a camp when we're doing more water and volume where the straw system she has is just for her while we're on to go so it's quick and simple um, and that's the system that works for us you know finding that journey we started with one system i think our first system was the the pills the the little horrible tabs. iodine style tabs. I don't think ours was iodine, but it, it was the same. Or something. Tastes yeah. like cordite. Cordite. Is that what this uh, is? Oh, That's the micro. Hmm. Anyway, somebody was saying they love theirs, and I was just yeah. what one I actually had. I've never, I've only ever actually used this once, so yeah. You can you can actually if, if you want to compare two products any two products there's usually a you Google it you can pretty well get the the specs on it so if you Googled uh, and I'm going to do it now Life Drive versus Sawyer Mini oh there's and there's probably people out there that have done YouTube reviews on that and give their opinion and once again it's kind of this giant you got to take um, you got to take all that information in and make your best decision based on the information we keep saying that and that's honestly what it comes down to your journey has to be your opinion don't let anyone force feed you something make sure it's something you want and it's going to do what you want it to to the best of its abilities like uh there's potentially no perfect product out there but maybe it's a product you can modify to be the perfect product like we said hammocks hugely modifiable whoopee slings stuff like that you can change them out makes them better uh knives you can add sharpeners ferro rods uh ranger bands different things tape 
I mean, this is all stuff you can add on to stuff. And there's tutorials out there on how to do that. So literally the research never really ends. Ben and I will both be like at work and we'll get the random text of, oh, hey, when you get home, check this out. It's something I just seen. What's your thoughts on that? And we could have uh, an hour discussion some night just on something we just seen. And we talk about the pros and cons of how we think it would work. And then based off of that, we may decide, okay, well, one of us, let's try this. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, so I have the numbers here. Because the Life Straw and the, and the Sawyer Mini sell for about the same price. The Life Straw filters out 99.9999% of bacteria. The Sawyer Mini has basically another point. So it's 0.9999. So it's five nines instead of four. Uh, and for Potazella, I can't even pronounce it all. Um, it goes still to four where Life Straw is just 99.9. .9. So most, but not all. Life Straw doesn't filter quite as much. And I think uh, the Sawyer Mini is good for like 150,000 gallon. And the Life Straw is gallons of water. The Life Straw is 1,000 gallons of water. So their size and weight are very similar uh one's longer and thinner the other shorter and fatter so you know safety wise i think they're close to equivalent here in north america they say if you're in certain places like africa there's a few more things that you might you might you might want to go to the the definitely consider the sire mini over here those aren't as big a concern and then there's like, uh different ones again grail growl or something like that they make another one that's supposed to be even thinner filtration once again reduced uh volume i think it's only good for maybe a thousand gallons or something like that as well but once again base your purchase on where you are going to be i don't see me running over to africa to go camping for a night so I'm probably pretty good with the Sawyer Mini or the Life Straw, honestly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not knocking, uh, you know, anyone who's taking the Life Straw. You have a fine product; it's a great product. Um, I'm a bit of a, a of a nerd geek when it comes to certain things, and those extra numbers meant something to me. But I know the reality is um, they don't; they're not not needed around here. The thing to keep in mind with both of them is, and I just read through it, is neither one filters out chemicals. Yeah. So if there's things like paints and oils and dirts and stuff that are in there that can hurt you, that's like a, from the chemical nature and not so much a, a, a biological nature, it's not going to help you. Um, so that's something to be aware of, uh, of course. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> what a lesson on life straws and Sawyer minis. But it's things like that that you look for when you're basing a product. Once again, you got two products that are very similar, same price points. Which one's going to be better for you? And honestly, we can't answer that for you. We like the Sawyer minis for the reasons we listed. Uh, there's a lot of our guests here in our comment section that will list why they like the life straw. Look at all the reasons. Make your own decision. Maybe you'll go with something completely different. Who knows? Like there's, there's more than one system out there. There's more than two systems out there. There's tens, if not hundreds of systems out there. Yeah. Some of them have uh, charcoal filters on them, which is, you know, you get yeah. rid of beasts and stuff. Some. That's why I got this one. It technically had an activated charcoal filter in it. Right. Yeah. And um, the only thing I can say on that, and you can kind of see it's like a paper and then there's a charcoal tube on the inside. Uh, when I, went out with Ben that time and we filtered the river water, there was still a lot of tannin left in it. Yeah. So that's something the charcoal filter may pull out. Didn't really bother me at all. I mean, it's ever so slightly bitter and it gave the water a slight discoloration, but perfectly safe to drink. Uh, but yeah. there's some people who may not be able to do that. Like I, I know somebody that can't drink town water because the chlorine literally burns their mouth or so they say. So that it's, you know, bottled water, spring watered or carbon filtered water. That's all they'll drink. And I mean, I've been skeptical and go, oh, no, that's all in your head and giving them water without telling them and they pick it up like that. You know what I mean? So sometimes there's stuff out there where they would probably invest into a carbon filtered water system. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what's the name of the one I just showed? It is a 
What's this? There you go. Catatine? Catatine? Sure. You know me and talking. Catatine. Don't Catatine. let the dyslexic try to say words. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've also been out there with the pump systems where people, you, you literally have a, a pump and it goes through a carbon or not a, car, um, a ceramic filter. I mean, great system in itself. Uh, I just found the whole process where having to manually sit there and work was a little bit annoying to me. I just preferred the, the you know, suspend it and hang it and walk away type deal. Uh, but what works for you? I mean, with that pump system or even the squeeze with the squeeze saw your mini means that you can do it a little quicker. Uh, so if you can't really wait for your water, you know, so be it. Um, I also found that the, uh, one of the downsides to the Sawyer mini is sucking water through it is actually a little harder than I think would be ideal. Yeah. Uh, I've tried the inline system for my camelback. Yeah. It works. Uh, I would not want to draw any great volume of water. No. Uh, without my head collapsing on itself. <laughs> <laughs> now with a life straw, not such an issue. I've been told you, you can get a pretty good sip on that pretty easy. Yeah. So. And that's probably the difference of those couple of percentage of filter is it allows a bit more volume through with a little less suction, um, which makes it a more functional tool um, for an on to go system. Yeah. So there's a little bit of talk about this in the comments there. Yes, they do make these bottle systems. Um, they were popular. When did I get this? 2012 ish is when I picked this up and this was actually a birthday present from mother-in-law. I th think you used to be able to buy the filters at Canadian tire since then. I don't think you can. I think it's one of those online specials only, uh, but it, it's a good system. My only drawback with it was the amount of water that goes into it. Uh, it's like 500 mils of best. It's like two cups of water, which is fine. If you're thirsty, don't get me wrong, but I, uh, um, and the uh, volume of water that goes through these wasn't overly significant either. It was uh, a couple hundred gallon, and that was it. But, I mean, still better than nothing uh, for protection against pathogen, bacteria, and cysts. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think the one the wife has, the, the, the little carbon filter on it is only good for maybe 10 gallons. Yeah, it's not a lot, and you have to take very good specific care of them to dry them out. Uh But yeah, not a bad system. Not knocking it at all. Just it has its limitations as well. You know what I mean? And, and that's, it, that's the thing. That, that, that is the thing. That's the whole thing with, you know, what type of camper are you? What do you want? What, you know, what's important to you? Is is the better filtration important or the more usability? If you're only doing one or two trips a year and, you know, the cost, is it is it worth spending $150 on one type of filter or is the $30 that say the life straw and sorry your mini falls into I mean at one point a couple of years ago they were both selling closer to 20 bucks uh, so they've gone up about 50% since I started buying them um, you know do you how long do you want to keep it is it some, something like that something that after a couple of years you just want to get rid of anyways and replace you know is anyone keeping a saw your mini for 100 thousand gallons i don't know probably well maybe somebody out there is but i can guarantee you i'll be changing it probably before i ever get close to that uh yeah. that level you know what i mean yeah. but uh no part of the journey i think for everyone to get the you know your loadout your kit it's it's going to be fairly unique for everyone we may share a lot of things i know me and my wife's kit are very similar because i tend to buy her the same stuff as, as I have. But then again, there's a little thing she likes that she's been throwing in her pack more and more that's different than mine. And that's cool. Like, I don't think it would be enjoyable if we all had the same kit. Um, but the trick is to get out there, to try things, to do stuff, to, to build it up. Nobody gets the perfect kit on the first time. Nobody goes out, buys everything they need the very first time. And says, I'm never going to change anything for the rest of my life. It would be boring, I think, if we did. Um, the trick is to get enough to get you out there the first time. And then each time or each every other time, improve one piece of gear. And if you do that 
and you get out a lot, before too long, you will have a loadout that I think you're very pleased with, very happy with, and it'll get harder and harder to find that next piece of gear that you want to upgrade or change. No, I Not agree. Me. And what I, sorry, I, I was listening to you. Uh, I threw yeah. a link in the comments there for anybody that was wondering about this bottle. They have since upgraded it to the uh, My Bottle. And I put up the link to the, the replacement filter, which will give you all the information. This is the only place I've ever been able to find a replacement filter for this thing, too. Uh, and they're a little tricky to get in Canada, but you sure as heck can do it if you do enough digging. Uh, and going back to the comments, because there was a few there. Um, uh, the filter fire, so that's the downside. Calling a crappy tire. Um coleman products in general please we all have crappy tire closest by uh so coleman products some are good some are bad i mean yeah. <laughs> it, it's like any other piece of equipment there that the first hammock i'm talking about at the back of my spiel here was a coleman hammock uh, i did not care for the coleman hammock um but it's not a bad hammock it, it, it's just i didn't care for it uh coleman makes great stoves lanterns and things like that i i don't know about their battery powered stuff or their propane powered stuff but their actual camp fuel stuff great awesome quality stuff um their propane stuff i'm assuming is great too uh, their battery powered stuff is probably the same as any other light manufacturer out there to be honest with you uh yeah. the coleman glow sticks i don't find any different than the dollar store ones so i mean yeah. it's one of those things if you're eyeballing a piece of gear Punch it into your search engine. See what the general reviews are. Don't go to the Coleman website. Don't go to the Canadian Tire website. Once again, you're going to go to those two extremes. It's junk or it's the best thing I ever bought, which honestly is going to be so... so vast on either side if they're reasoning that it's probably not going to help you well. But it, it's... I have nothing against Coleman products, bottom line. You know what I mean? Some of them are going to work really good for you. Some of them are not going to do what you want them to. But that's going to be said about any manufacturer out there. Coleman has a solid reputation, been in the camping business for a while. I was going to say, the one thing I think of it with Coleman, though, is generally a lot of my my car camping gear. Yeah, and that's kind of where I was trying to lean without coming out and saying it. They're great yeah. campground camp equipment. My, I have a Coleman two-burner stove. I, I'm never going to camp with it, like in the backwoods. But if I'm going to a park, I'm going out of my car, I will take that 100% of the time. It's it's great. I have a little oven that goes on top of that thing. Again, it's relatively lightweight, but still not light enough weight, enough weight that I'm carrying it in the canoe, you know, 30 miles in the woods. Uh, but I could. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a possibility. But... They're just not known for their ultralight gear. They're just, it's not something that Coleman is, is, has that reputation for, right? Uh, solid uh, car camping gear for sure. So we just had somebody saying they're going to try out the Platypus uh, Gravity Works filtration system. And honestly, uh, just eyeballing it at face value, that is basically the setup that ben and i have created with our sawyer minis uh yeah. like literally it looks stone cold identical and i i just sent the link over to ben there if he wants to glance at it but i'm pretty sure he has an idea of what's running through his head it, it's like a gravity bag with an inline filter system uh and that like i said that's basically what we made out of our sawyer minis yeah uh and i don't think it has any better filtration than the sawyer mini uh, filters up to 1.75 liters a minute. Microfilter lifetime of 1,500 liters of water. Uh, no pumping. It's all gravity fed. Removes 99.123459s of bacteria and 99.9% .9 of protozoa. So like I said, very similar yeah. numbers to the uh, Sawyer Mini. Well, it's four, so it's closer to this. Actually, it's almost identical to Lystra. Not as good as the Sawyer Mini for... For effectivity that's four decimal points points in one and a sire mini was five and four um which again for north america is fine what's your 
lifetime volume. Lifetime volume is around the life straw, 1,500 ga yeah. uh, gallon. 1,500 liters. Liters, uh, sorry. Yeah, so the life straw was 1,000 gallons, I think, where uh, the Sell Your Mini was 100,000 gallons. But honestly, um, those bags look awesome. Yeah, the bags themselves are actually really good really with Slice your saw your mini right into that existing system. Uh, price tag's a little steep on that for my liking. It's 140 bucks is what Mech has it on for. Yeah. So I yeah, so I paid about twenty something for my saw your mini. You can pick one up, I think not right now in the thirties zone. And those woods uh, bags that me and you were using, we paid ballpark ten bucks each for them. They were on clearance. Hmm. So I we paid the, the bags for four dollars and bought tons yeah. of them. Yeah. I yeah, so you know, similar setup that we managed to come up with. I mean, piecing it from, uh, together from stuff from here to there, under fifty bucks. And somebody's asking about the Millbank bags. Uh, I have personally not used one. No. Um, I've watched a lot of videos on them, stuff like that, when I was doing my decision on what I wanted to use for a water filtration system. Um, and honestly, once again, it comes down to the Sawyer Mini fit all my needs at a better price point. Not saying the other ones are bad or not worth their money. For me, what I do, where I go, uh, I, I was quite happy with my Sawyer Mini. Yeah, um, like you said, though, I mean, there's plenty of systems out there, and I don't, I mean, we don't really want to knock someone's system because the reality is if it gets you out there and it's working for you and you've had absolutely no problems, then that's the system for you. It's like the old uh, adage, what's the best camera? The best camera is the one you have. Yep. Does uh, it work? And did it work for you? If you can answer yeah. yes to both of those, it's yeah. a great piece of gear. Now, yeah. is there something that may suit your needs better? Maybe. But that's, that's where, like, I, we, right now we talk with the Sawyer Mini. That's the system we use. That's not to say in six months we won't find something that we like a lot better. And we would gladly then use that same argument as this is why I chose this. Yeah. Or this is why I chose that. Um, and, yeah, everything we say is strictly our opinions. We are not yeah. telling you to go out and buy Sawyer Mini because it is the best thing on the market. It happens to be what we both use. This is our reasoning behind it. If you like the reasoning, bang for your buck, it's one of the best things on the market. I think it, it's really hard to beat bang for buck. It, it's like right up there with the life straw. The only advantage that I see with the life straw is no added parts. Dump your straw in the water, take a sip. That's your big attractant. For me, with the Sawyer Mini, it was yeah, you got to buy a few other things to make it work great. But we're talking a hundred and fifty thousand thousand liters of water or something like that. Like more than I would drink. Probably you know, in the entirety of me going camping. Chances are I'm going to replace that because I broke it before it's going to, you know, run out. Even yeah. half that, it's 75,000 liters. It's still probably more than I'm ever going to drink. 100,000 gallons. That's the thing. 100,000 gallons. Yeah, that's a lot of water. We're talking swimming pools here, like in volume, right? Um, but that's not 100,000 gallons without back flushing. That's not 100,000 gallons without a certain level of, of maintenance minor maintenance some of these other products there is no maintenance you use it until it stops working you throw it away yep where the sodium mini, you're right you do have the syringe you do have to have clean water to back flush it with so if you wait it too long and it plugged right up now you have to get clean water from somewhere to be able to back flush it um there's, there's little things to it. It, it there is work there is volume there is weight um and all things you have to weigh as you're taking your stuff out you know what I mean? So, yeah. but uh, um, it's, oh. it's the product we chose that we tend to use because we were very happy with the volume, the filtration rate, uh, the size and weight. Um, for us, it was the package that worked. <laughs> but, Just reading a comment. Uh, you what was it? Comment? Okay. So, Steve, bottom line. Buy cheap to get out there. Decide what sucks. Upgrade what you need to. Live, learn, and love the wilderness. Don't get pulled in by brand names and fake reviews. Eat bacon. It's good. And I got to the bacon, and that's where I started laughing. Yeah, yeah, bacon. Bacon's that's amazing. It. Turkey's good, too. Just going to say. Ready Crisp. Ready Crisp is our, our recommendation. Actually, the 
the the compliments brand is just as good as the right the ready crisp which is i think maple leaf or whatever but walmart any of these, has its own version too and it's fine yeah it's hard to screw any, up bacon yeah basically no refrigeration required crisps up in seconds super easy to use super <laughs> important part of gear i mean yeah. <laughs> but yeah bottom line for ben and i that's what we do we tend to, uh, we're not afraid to spend more money, but if it's something we have no experience on and we just kind of want to get the feel for something, yeah, we'll buy cheap just to see if we like the concept. And then we can decide if it's something we want to sink serious money into. Uh, yeah. If you hit that level where the cheap stuff's almost as much as the expensive stuff, you kind of have to tackle that a little different. But yeah, bottom line for us is some we usually buy cheap just to see if we like concept. And then yeah. we'll upgrade where we think it's worth. Uh, and yeah, we're learning love. I mean, like I said, you can have just as much fun going out there with something that doesn't work as you do that works. I mean, granted, it's not something important that's going to drive you nuts. But I mean, I've taken out like a shovel thinking, oh, I'm going to try this shovel. And I mean, it was <laughs> it was not good. We had a lot of fun with it. I mean, we bent it all around, beat the snot out of it, had some fun with it. it but I took it out expecting it kind of to fail. You know what I mean? I would have been yeah. pleasantly surprised if it didn't. I have had gear like that. That pleasantly surprised. It works great. But, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good way to sum that up, Steve, in all honesty. Eat bacon. It's good. Eat bacon. Anyways, we've uh, killed an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, and then some. Uh, and we should probably go. Like I guess I, I predicted early on this would run. And, uh, you know, there's a thousand examples of this that we've done with pots, pans, knives, you you name it, to uh, tarps, the guidelines, the odd little things that we've, you know, I'm right now planning on upgrading a lot of my guidelines to reflective because every time I get out there with the reflective gear, I think the first time I used it was the one tiger stuff. Uh, but it's not, that's not the brand I'm going with. I'm just going to buy really good reflective guidelines and change it out on my mosquito hammock. Uh, set up just because I'm sick and tired of tripping over lines. <laughs> no, and I mean, I, that was something I did with some, I, I don't think I've ever taken my tent out with you. Same thing. I had some 550 paracord that had the reflective strip built into it. That's yeah. where I switched out all my guy lines for on my tent. Yeah. So, I do have a question. I see videos of people cooking with lard. Is this an actual thing? I mean, it's not, I'm not 70, but not sure that frying pan of lard laden food is cool. Um, yeah, it's a real thing. Not going to lie. Uh, cooking with lard, uh, growing up that, that was the staple of my grandparents is cooking nonstick. A uh, lard is great for seasoning cast iron too. Lard and cast iron go hand in hand. It's, we're getting into a health thing now, really out of witchcraft, but there is an argument. There's a group out there now. There's, there's, there's some pretty strong evidence that lard is much better than say vegetable oil or canola oil corn oil that lard is a much healthier option um and in fact i can tell you personally uh we've replaced the oil in our deep fryer with lard so, so yeah it's a real thing we strongly encourage you to do some research on it make your own decision yeah um yeah I, i'm not going to tell someone to do one thing for, for health and stuff like i eat a certain way i I found that that can be a very polarizing thing. Some people have attacked me for the way I eat. Other people praise me. The end result is you have to make that decision on your own. Uh, but no, there's there's an argument either way. Sir, lard t does tend to deal better with heat than a lot of the other oils that break down. And that's what creates some of the, the good oils and bad oils. A lot of them start off very, very fine, very safe. And if you're eating them at room temperature, that's fine. But when you start heating them up, certain oils can handle heat a lot better than others. Lard being one of the ones that does a very good job of it. Uh, that's that's a scientific fact. But um, yeah, we could we could spend hours on that and probably start a totally different channel. Uh, maybe you know, with the greenings would be a good spot to talk about that. <laughs> um, but anyway, like Ben said, we're up on an hour and 40 minutes now. I suppose we should try and wrap this in a little bit. I hope we answered everybody's questions. Uh, I know we derailed a few times, but if you're new to budget bushcraft, that's kind of our thing. Uh, we say what we need to say, and that's just kind of how it goes. Good, bad, or otherwise. <laughs> Good, bad, or otherwise. We are what we are. We pretend to be no one different. Um, 
We'd love to see you guys get out there, try new things. Uh, as you update gear, let us know what you, you've upgraded to, and, and uh, we'd love to hear about it. Steve McDonald from New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Well, bud, I am literally six minutes from you. I'm in Thorburn. Hmm. So there you go. And I'm not going to get any closer than that because uh, security issues and all that good stuff. But, uh, yeah, not that far away, so maybe shoot us a message sometime, and uh, if Ben's down this way or I'm heading that way, maybe we'll hook up for coffee. I know we got to do that with Chris one of these times. So, uh... It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. We should do our own gathering. You know what? We should. Well, we have enough people in Nova Scotia now, we'll have an Atlantic bushcraft gathering. But Yeah. Anyways, uh, <laughs> <I'll> go, <buddy. laughs> anyway. <laughs> have a good night, everybody.